Well, hello, everyone. It's good to be here with you. Uh, thanks, Stephen, for the introduction. It's an honor to be with both a lot of old and new friends. I met uh, a guy in the, in the foyer a little while ago who the last time I saw him was a brand new second lieutenant. He's the son of a friend of my brother-in-law's. And it's interesting to see a group of people who I was telling Matt uh, a little while ago that I look across the audience, a lot of you all were majors and captains that I served with, so I'm really feeling old. Uh, shout out to Seminar 11, who I got to spend time with. Uh, OK, keep it down. All right. Uh, and, and especially Matt Palmer, who's allowed me to hang around with him over the last two days for the conference. There's been a whole lot of uh, specifically enlightening and provocative comments made by uh, so many over the last two days. I, I wrote a few of them down, some great reflections on myriad aspects of strategic leadership. Nick Ryan, a good friend of mine, we were together in Iraq, uh, a great ally. Uh, his list of strategic leader qualities, I'm going to talk about a few of those in a second, but I thought that was very interesting. Uh, Tori Newland this morning when she was talking about the expansion of the role of DIME, which everyone talks about. You know, you have to be a War College graduate in order to talk about DIME, and she certainly put it in perspective when she said those four letters have to be expanded uh, based on what you've learned in the course when you become the strategic leaders. Matt Cavanaugh, uh, yesterday his comments about superior judgment and critical decision making were right on target, but I would say I disagree with him slightly because I think there's a little bit more to it than that. Uh, th those are things where you can really determine the strategic leader, but uh, as we all recall, Washington certainly applied both of those in his campaign in the revolution, but he had a few failures before then where he learned a whole lot of lessons uh, in leadership. Rebecca Johnson of Mac War, uh, campaigning for strategic effects. I thought that was an interesting term that she used. Uh, it seems like uh, a lot of our sister schools, and I'm not a graduate of the Army War College, I went to National, uh, but it seems like a lot of our sister schools, since I was the J7, are really up in their game in terms of their professors and the way they're studying the operational and strategic levels of war since I was uh, accrediting uh, the various war colleges back in 2001. I'll talk a little bit more about uh, that in a second. All the opening comments in his presentation by Dr. Metz. Uh, Steve, I hope you sent a copy of that out to everybody. If you didn't, they should get a copy because I did and there are some real gems of, of things we should be thinking about. And then finally, uh, my good friend, Major General uh, Dunlop, a little while ago, thank you for the shout out, Charlie, if you're in the audience, there you are back in the back. Uh, thank you for that very kind shout out, but especially thank you uh, for the story about salad dressing. Uh, you know, one of the other things about strategic leadership is you do have to learn to eat and drink for your country on multiple occasions. And his salad dressing uh, story reminded me of one time I was in Georgia. I understand we have a Georgian student in the audience. All right, there we go. Hello, sir. Uh, I was in Georgia at a Supra. And uh, we were in a reception. This was after about a two week. I was a one star general at the time. I'd just come back from Iraq uh, doing the training center at Grafenbeer. Uh, and we went, we took over the train and equip mission from the Marines, and we were out in near the training site near Tbilisi. After two weeks there, we had a big supra, which is a big feast afterwards. And uh, in the opening uh, reception, they had beer, some great Georgian beer. So I took a beer but made the huge mistake, the huge uh, uh, cultural, as they say in France, Faux Pass, to take that beer <laughs> into, into the dining room with me. And when it was time for the toast, I'm more of a beer drinker than a wine drinker. All the Georgians stood up to toast with their Serapino. Uh, is that how you say it? OK, close enough, the type of wine. And I raised my beer glass. And about four Georgian officers jumped on me and said, no, no sir, you can't toast with beer. That's, that's a cultural, uh, just t terrible thing to do. You have to toast with wine. So being the smart ass I was, I said, well, what happens if you toast with beer? And he says, well, you can toast with beer, as I understand the, the tradition, but you have to say the opposite of what you mean. I said, <laughs> OK. And I, I turned to one of the colonels, and I said, can you provide an example of, of how to do that? And he said, sure, give me your beer. And he takes my beer, and he says, to Putin's health. And he put it down. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, again, I want to thank uh, everybody for putting on this conference. It's needed. And I also want to thank the Carlisle Foundation because they do a lot of things that you may or may not know that they do, uh, but all the folks that contributed to this. Um, you know, in, Colonel Metz, Colonel Cuccia, my old next door neighbor uh, from Wiesbaden, uh, John Kim, have asked me to provide the closing remarks to what was a very intense and, like I said, provocative and thought provoking conference. And in doing that, I'd like to talk about three things. That's what speakers usually do. They talk about three things. Uh, first, I'd really like to outline, if you'll give me the opportunity, some of my experiences after the War College. Because all of you have come here. You get selected for this course. You've come from battalion command, many of you, or some kind of other unbelievably intense job where you've been working for your organization and being you were raised in a meritocracy, and then you're selected for the pinnacle of strategic schools at the War College, and you come here, and there is a transition point. And truthfully, I didn't realize it until I got out of the War College at National. And the strategic implications started hitting me like a ton of bricks. So what I'm going to do is describe some of those to you because they will hit you. And all the theory and the philosophy that we've talked about the last two days and what you've talked about over the year, I'm going to try and apply some meat to the bones of those to show you how they are seen by someone who's leaving a school like this, then going out as a colonel or a colonel level individual and addressing some of the issues and how the challenges are just flat different. And I think that will help you understand strategic leader more than the definitions. The second thing I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, channel my old life as the commander of the ops group at the National Training Center, the COG, Outlaw 01 that I was a long, long time ago, and do something that no one else I don't think has done that I remember, and I'm going to show a couple slides and define leadership. Or better yet, I'm going to use the doctrinal definition and a model that I've put together that should be familiar to you, although it's not shown this way in our doctrinal manual of ADRP 6-22. But when I was asked to put a leadership program together for a bunch of doctors at the hospital I now work with, I used the Army's doctrinal manual and our attributes and competencies and put it in a model that doctors could understand. Now, it's the same that you know about, but maybe it's just showing it to you different. Then the third thing, what I'll do is uh, try and provide some thoughts on how to use that model that is in our doctrinal manual to fill in the blanks uh, on strategic leader attributes and competencies that I have found. Th these aren't theory or philosophy. These are things that I've experienced or in talking with others at strategic levels have seen happen that perhaps aren't addressed as, as well as they should be in our doctrinal manuals, but maybe you can start taking the list that is geared specifically to what you're going to be asked to do. Okay, so first, my personal experience. I graduated from the National War College in 1998. I retired a few years ago as the commanding general of US Army Europe in 2013. Now, for those of you who are math challenged, I took a little time beforehand and, and wrote down, that's 15 years. The reason I'm saying that is because the title of this conference is 2030 Strategic Leadership. So if this is the class, and I think I have this right, if this is the class of 2018, that means some of you who are aspiring to be major command, theater commanders like me, or you just want to be like this magnificent specimen of manhood before you, <laughs> in 2033, you're still going to be around. Because that's how long I transpired between my graduation and when I retired, 15 years. Now, that sort of puts this conference title in a little bit different perspective, doesn't it? Strategic leadership in 2030. It becomes a little bit more ominous when you think about you will, be, you will be, I'm not saying you may be, you will be a part of this. 
Um, and, you know, it's interesting because, as I recalled my experience, we also had a conference like this at the National War College in 1998. It was called Joint Vision 2010. And all we wanted to do was get back out to our operational jobs, and this Joint Vision was kind of theoretical. And you know what? I've looked back at that Joint Vision 2010 and 2015 and 2020 because it was updated, and most of the things that were said in those pamphlets and documents that were published by the joint staff came true. Although there were some things that didn't allow them to come true, like a couple of wars that we weren't anticipated in 19, anticipating in 1998. Um, so you might ask, did I go through this ominous strategic change between 1998 and 2013? I'm going to give you an example by reviewing some of the hallmarks of my career. Now, I'm not doing that to impress you. I'm just saying these are the things that happened, and they will actually point to some of the things you've discussed. Okay, so from the War College, I went straight to Brigade Command. And you say, well, that's a tactical organization. Yes. And I was a year and a half into my command. Uh, it was the 3rd Brigade of the 2nd Infantry Division at Fort Lewis, Washington, a tank-heavy brigade separate from its sister or its, its parent unit in Korea. I had about 9,000 soldiers, two tank battalions, an infantry battalion, an engineer battalion, an FSB, an artillery battalion, and an air defense company battery. And I was living the dream. Fort Lewis, Washington. We were going back and forth to Korea on a couple of exercises, and that's all good. That's what tactical commanders do. And then, with 18 months in and six months to go, I had an NTC rotation. So I went to the NTC as a brigade commander, and on the second day, the COG, who happened to be my classmate, a guy named Ben Frakely, came up with a cell phone. And he said, Mark, uh, you need to take this call. Now, knowing as I did that cell phones weren't allowed in the box, I thought it was another trick of those bastards OCs. I said, Ben, I'm not taking it. I'm not violating the rules. He goes, you need to take it. It's from the chief of staff of the Army. Now, I thought to myself, that's pretty cool. <laughs> the chief of staff calls everybody in the box and wishes them luck before their first assignment? No. So I got on the line, and it was General Shinseki, and he said to me, Mark, how's the rotation going? I said, sir, so far it's going great. Thanks for asking. Why are you calling? And he said, well, the reason I'm calling, this was October, he said, the reason I'm calling is the AUSA conference starts tomorrow. And I'm making an announcement, and it has to do with your brigade, and you know nothing about it. So just hang on. Do your rotation. When you're done in 10 days, we'll have another conversation. Well, the announcement he was making was the unveiling of the striker concept. So in my last six months of brigade command, which I thought was going to be real easy, and I was going to coast to the end, all hell broke loose. All kinds of four-star generals wanted to interfere. Congressmen were coming out to see us. I got my first iteration of the press and the media wanting to find out what this brigade was all about. And I was thrust from being a tactical commander into a strategic environment. And I can't relate to you all the things that occurred, but it was different. I realized for the first time that it wasn't about me and my guys, my unit. It was literally, and I hate this term, but it was literally about the enterprise of the US Army. OK. So after command, uh, when I gave up command six months later, after the last six months of, of some really tough work, I was asked to be the commander of the ops group at the NTC, Outlaw 01. Went to the desert, not knowing what that job would entail. But I, I went there thinking I had been a pretty good commander, brigade commander. And I realized after about a month there in my first rotation that I was probably the worst battalion commander in the world. Uh, excuse me, brigade commander in the world because I saw what right looked like that I had not done as a brigade commander. And after 18 rotations as the COG, I realized the second issue of strategic leadership is you better start being humble, and you better not start thinking that you're better than anybody else, because you're not. There are a lot of great people out there. OK, so while at the NTC, I was selected for Brigadier General. Now. 
I was, I had the great honor of, we, we, you mentioned the Goldwater Nichols Act earlier when we were talking to Ambassador Newland. I had the great honor of having been the last joint slacker. And what that meant back then in the day was you were selected for Brigadier General, but you had never been to a joint assignment. So I had to get to one quick or I would not be promoted. So in August of 2001, they said, we got a job for you. It's a sleepy little job on the joint staff. It'll get you your JSO, and we'll be getting you back to the field. The job in August of 2001 was chief of war plans, the vice J7 of the joint staff. OK. Yeah, you're laughing. I arrived, and within a month, some planes hit some buildings. Uh, killed one of our uh, J7 people. I was the vice J7. My boss, who was a three-star, a guy named Pete Osman, Marine, uh, was pulled out to go to Turkey. And I was left as a promotable colonel as the J7 on the joint staff with a bunch of three-stars that made up the J1, the J2, the J3, the J4, the J5, J6, and me. One star, not yet and we were at war. Um, while I was in that job, I not only saw the start of the war against Afghanistan and the start of the war against Iraq and the planning that went involved in that, but I saw a whole lot of interagency churn and coordination. Now, many of you, and it was interesting, some of the questions going on this morning, because many of you don't realize it at the time, but in our war plans, and I hope I'm not giving up anything secret. If I am, I'm past the statute of limitations, so it's OK. Uh, there's something called Annex Victor in every single war plan. You all know that. That's the interagency annex. That's when the interagency in a war plan document says, here's what we will do as the State Department, USAID, FBI, CIA, DEA, whoever you happen to be from the agency, you have an annex in every war plan called Annex Victor. We went to a, um, an actual war game at National where we had all the military and all the interagency there, and I yanked out Annex Victor for a certain war plan that we were getting ready to execute. And uh, a guy named Link Bloomfield, who was a State Department official, said, where'd you get that? And I said, well, sir, your agency, your State Department provided us. He said, we didn't do that. I said, well, where'd it come from? And my major pulled on my sleeve and said, sir, we had to write that because no one from the State Department wanted to do it. So it was the military approach to what they thought the State Department action should be. So what Ambassador Newland said before about making friends, yes. You not only have to make friends, but you have to build consensus. And it can't be in your little cone. You have to get outside your comfort zone and really interact with other people. And by the way, that was my first lesson on interagency coordination. The next time I saw that occurring was when I was in Iraq, and Ambassador Crocker was there, who was magnificent. He is the role model for everyone in the Foreign Service, in my humble opinion. And he took a great deal of pride in mentoring senior military officers, strategic leaders all ambassadors to do that. So that was my second understanding of the interagency process. My next one was later on when I went back to USER and eventually became the G3. Whenever uh, I would go to a foreign country, and by the way, there are 49 countries in the European theater of operation that, were, that fell in my footprint, and three countries in the Levant at the time, Lebanon, Syria, and Israel, that I was responsible for as the commander of US Army Europe. Every time I traveled to those, and I traveled to every single one of them, my first stop when I landed was the embassy to talk with the country team. That's strategic leadership because it's outside the realm of US Army Europe but you have to understand what the interagency is doing before you apply your actions to the next group of people you're talking to. Um, so that interagency coordination, you know, I, I've been here just two days and I've heard a lot of conversation about our fellow soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and our international students, but I haven't heard mention of the civilians in the audience. And this is your first opportunity to really make the connection. Now, I know you only have a couple of weeks left, but nuzzle up to them. I'm sitting up next to Matt before 
Uh, when someone said this morning, you can get a heck of a lot of intelligence from the Treasury Department, I personally didn't know that. Treasury's got a treasure trove, no pun intended, of intel on our foes and our friends in terms of how they do banking and how they fund things. So if you happen to be an, a military intelligence officer in the, in the audience, or if you're just someone who wants to expand your horizon, that would be an interesting stuff. Is there anybody from the Treasury in here as part of the class? That's unfortunate. But get with your other civilians, like the Army civilians, the Air Force civilians, CIA, DIA. I don't know who you have in terms of your, your various folks. But nuzzle up to them in your last two weeks and say, let's exchange contacts so when we leave here. By the way, two of my classmates in my seminar at the National War College were both from the State Department. We had a, a wider swath. Both of them went to embassies that were bombed the next year. OK. After two years on the joint staff and doing all those things I just talked about, I'm still in my career. You're still with me? Are you bored yet? OK. Two years in my job, I then went back to the field and became the assistant division commander for the 1st Armored Division in Baghdad. My boss also happened to be my best friend, Marty Dempsey. Now, General Dempsey and I lived next door to each other at West Point when we were both captains. We used to mow the grass, drink beer in the back, and talk about how screwed up the Army was. And if we were in charge, we would fix it. I'll get back to that in a second. <laughs> but Marty had come out of the Pentagon as a one star and was given a job in OPM Sang by the, the um, chief of staff of the Army. And he thought it was the end of his career. But instead, at, after two years working in Saudi Arabia, he was sent to command a division in combat where he had to deal with terrorism, networks, and it was very different than the likes of which the two of us grew up with in either Desert Storm or the fields of the Imperial Army of the Rhine in Europe when we were young soldiers there. I watched him as I arrived, having never done that, do the networking and establish the terrorism cells and the targeting in Baghdad in 2003. Now, to all of you today, that's normal ways of doing business. But back then, man, that was laser brain surgery. It was tough. And he knew how to do it because he knew the culture and the environment. Um, after the tour in Iraq, I returned to Germany and took over uh, at Grafenbeer, the seventh, at the time, the 7th Army Training Command, which has been renamed to the 7th Army Training Command now. But my boss, General B.B. Bell, who was like a well-hit golf ball inside of a telephone booth, because he would bounce all around and give orders, and we would execute things. He told me, go down there because of the changing nature of the European footprint. What we want to do is bring our allies and coalition partners into what we were doing in combat, both in Afghanistan and Iraq. So he set the conditions for overcoming political caveats for force by different countries. And the first one, the first country that signed up that I came to become very fond of were the Poles. The Polish government and the Polish Chad said to themselves, we've got an opportunity to join the United States, to train with them, to learn their way of doing business, and all we got to do is help them fight a war. Sign us up. So they started coming to Grafenbeer. General, uh, General Bell then said to me, we need to change our approach. We need to have an expeditionary training center. We don't need to have everybody come here. We need to go out to them in Hungary and Romania and Bulgaria and Croatia. So we started doing that. He said, rename the place. One of my staff colonels came up to me and said, sir, let's call it the Expeditionary Training Center. The ETC? The et cetera? We're calling the Training Center the et cetera? <laughs> there is value in messaging. And not only is there value in messaging, there sometimes is money in messaging. Having my experience in the joint world and in the J7, I said, the reason JRTC at Fort Polk gets more money than the NTC is because they have joint in their name. So let's call this place the Joint Multinational Training Center. We'll get all kinds of money from DOD, and we did. We got $21 million that year just because of the name change. That's strategic leadership and understanding what motivates other people. I'm not making this up, folks, OK? Budgeteers, are there budgeteers in the audience? Is that true or not? 
If you put joint in your name, do you get more money? Of course you do. The War College knows that. All of you need to understand that. All right. <laughs> After a year at Graf and Beer, General Bell called me, the guy that's the well-hit golf ball in a telephone booth, and he said, I want you to be my G3. So I went to the command headquarters in Kaiserslautern, and, or I'm sorry, in Heidelberg, and when I got there, he said, I've just been given a task by the Secretary of All Defense, Mr. Rungfeld, who said, we have 90,000 soldiers in Europe. We don't need that many. Bring it down to 24,000. Where 24,000 came from, I don't know, but that was the number the SecDef gave them. So we literally redesigned the transformed force of Europe in about a couple of months, me helping him. It was his concept. We just did white papers and really took a look at what would be the best for the Army, what would be the best for the unit, what would be the thing that the Secretary of Defense would accept, and what was he out to do? And this, this plan, this transformation plan, went from about 2004 until 2009. We had to expand it to 2011 and then 13 because of the war and sending deploying forces back and forth into different theaters. I remember saying to myself in 2005 after we put the plan on, I said, you know, it was really easy to do this plan, but who's ever commanding Europe in 2011 is really going to suck. Hold that thought, OK? <laughs> Um, there were some other things that happened, but the, the most interesting thing, General Bell was replaced by General McKiernan. He came into my office one day and he said, Mark, I've got good news and bad news for you. He said, the good news is you've been selected to command a division. That's a big deal because there's only 10 of them in our army. And he said, the bad news is it's the first armored division. I said, sir, what's so bad about that? He goes, you're going to combat in three months as part of the surge. This was in 2007. I said, OK, I got it. That's the mission. Thank you, sir. Going to combat. And he says, and there's more bad news. He says, you're taking your headquarters and nobody else with you. He says, all of the 1st Armored Division units are staying here in Germany because they've got plans on the patch chart. Remember that? They're going back and forth. You're just taking your 800-person headquarters. You're getting 30,000 soldiers from other locations throughout the United States. You're going to prove the concept of the first plug-and-play division. Now, we did that normally after that, but the first time you do it, it's kind of hard. Because I didn't know those cats. And I was a tanker. And most of the brigades I, were getting, I was getting were from light divisions. And it's a different culture. So I got a brigade from the 82nd, a brigade from the 101st, a brigade from the 10th Mountain, and they didn't know me from Adam. I was that tanker guy with the funny boots. Now, personalities matter, context is important, and how you build teams at the strategic letter level takes on a whole new different aspect. As I went into northern Iraq and NMD North, I also had five Iraqi divisions and 60,000 Iraqi policemen. I had a border with Syria, Turkey, and Iran. And everybody was going to Baghdad, which was not in my area, because that's where the surge was focused. So I had the secondary theater of operations with three boundaries over 1,500 miles and with a force that I didn't know. When I came back from Iraq, I won't go into that. That's a whole other story. That's, if, if Charlie Dunlap was talking about a three-beer story, that's about a case and a half right there. Um, when I came back, I did another job in, I, in initial military training. I won't talk much about that because I, all I got was mission orders from my new boss, the TRADOC commander, who happened to be General Dempsey. And he said, I don't know what's wrong with basic training, but it's broke. Go fix it. Those were no kidding my orders. So as a strategic leader, you have to take a look at the, again, the enterprise and say, how do you do the analysis to make sure what you're doing next contributes to the organization as a whole, and it brings the soldiers to the field that you need there, or whoever you're doing. After that job, I got a call from General Casey. And he said, Mark, I'm thinking about 
making, since we've transformed Europe and there's only going to be about 40,000 soldiers there, we're going we're to downgrade the command position from a four-star to a three-star. Do you want it? What would you say? So I said, yes. What I didn't know at the time was the demands of fighting above your weight class in a strategic environment. Because all of my other US commanders in Europe were still four stars. General Welsh, who I, I love to death, the Air Force, former Air Force Chief of Staff, was you safety commander. Uh, General Harris, who's about to become an ambassador, I think, was the NAV commander. I had an admiral for my boss. I had four four stars who were using my theater, and because I was the, the main agency for all the support, like post offices and driver's licensing and all that other crap in Europe, I had to support four different four stars, and I had those 49 countries with 49 ambassadors over me. In a strategic environment, you have to determine your time constraints, you have to figure out who your helpers are, and you've got to give them messages and communicate in a different way than just push to talk. OK, again, I, I don't tell you all those things to say, boy, woe is me. What I will tell you is the year after I graduated from the War College and we had talked about strategic leadership, I was thrown into it. And from 1998 until 2013, I didn't have a whole time to reflect because the missions were coming fast and furious. But the things that we learned in your seat in the big blue bedroom at National War College are the things you will apply. I'm not trying to scare you because they will come at you a bite at a time most of the time. And as my wife once told me when she was citing the great uh, poet laureate Will Smith, you don't have to build a perfect wall. You just have to lay one perfect brick at a time. These are what strategic leaders are sometimes asked to do, and oftentimes you don't even know you're being asked to do it. So all these things require different kinds of vision, different kind of analysis, unique team building approaches, an upgrade in your character, a more visible presence when you can in determining where you put that presence, an expanded intellect to be sure, especially with the challenges you all are going to face with things like artificial intelligence and swarms and all the things that Dr. Metz talked about on the very first day. It's also going to require a more refined and mature approach to building trust, developing teams, and achieving results. Now, I use those six terms purposely because that's what our doctrine says we do. Can, uh, it's what you've been trained to do at the lower level. You just need to start filling in the blanks a little bit and making it less geared to all about you and more geared to the enterprise versus your organization. Can you bring in the first slide, please? You know, I'm going to now, I'm, if you haven't noticed, I'm now expanding into my second phase of this talk, which is my days as the cog, relying on doctrine. Well, that was a great plan, Colonel. What does doctrine say about this? Ah, well, let's talk about a way to address this. You've seen this before, right? That's the definition in our doctrine. Would you say it's pretty good? Oh, man, don't take a picture on a, on a Mac Air on this. Come on, you should have this. <laughs> this should be ingrained. Don't be taking pictures. You can have the slides later on. Don't be taking pictures of this. Come on, this is doctrine. It's a, oh, you're from Sweden. Okay, take, yeah. <laughs> Knock yourself out there. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you. Did I embarrass you? No, you're all right. Okay, okay, good. The Swedes would say, as I've once heard it said by a lot of Europeans, and I'm sure you've heard a thousand times here, a serious problem is in planning against American doctrine is the Americans do not read their manuals, nor do they feel any obligation to follow their doctrine. That was from a German general in World War II when they were trying to defeat us at Remagen. 
they were asked, what's the doctrine for a river crossing? It doesn't matter because the Americans don't read their doctrines. So that's what our training center has tried to impart on a generation of soldiers. So that's the doctrine. It defines leadership. And I personally, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this in a second when we get into phase three. I don't, that's not sufficient for strategic level. And I hate to be throwing stones at our doctrine, but it doesn't do it for me. I mean, this, this doesn't scratch my itch at all. I mean, it was great as a battalion commander, don't get me wrong, and it's good as a doctrinal manual for training young sergeants, but it doesn't hit what you all are looking for. So let's talk a little bit more about what comes after the definition. What comes after the definition are these two things. It talks about the attributes, who a leader is, and the competencies, what a leader does. And we use these three words. You've all heard these, right? Be, no do. You ask any private on the street coming out of basic training, they will tell you be, no do is our military doctrine, our leadership doctrine. But we got to fill in the blanks a little bit because you wrap the attributes around the be and the no and the competencies around the do. Now let's go a little further. The attributes, what kind of person are you and how do other people see you? And the closer you can get those two things together, who you are and how you're seen, the better off you are. Again, we're still in our doctrine. So this is for the young guys. This is for the lieutenants and the lieutenant colonels and the sergeants. The no piece is really focused on that as you go through the doctrinal descriptions. And then the do piece really focuses on these three things. Trust being the cornerstone of leadership. So how do you establish trust in your organization? How do you build teams? And how do you achieve results? Now, I took that and developed this based on some other words that are in there for the doctors at Florida Hospital. When you take a look at the, and all these things are described in our manual. This, this isn't new. None of this is Hurtling's thinking. This is what it describes. It comes under character. Who you are, your personal background, how you've grown up, what kind of conversations you've had around the dinner table, what church you went to, what schools you went to, how it affected the way you are, the person you are today, your style, you know, introvert, extrovert. You all taken the personality inventories that tell you how you lead or how you interact with other people your values. Would it surprise you? I think if we went through all the servicemen and women in the audience, they would tell you what their service values are. The Army folks would do the leadership thing, loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, personal courage. Courage, candor, and commitment, I think, is the Navy. Is that right? Honor, honor courage, commitment. So you know what your values are. You know what you believe in. They help you make decisions. With the doctors I talk to, I say, so, First, I ask them, what are the hospital's values? None of them know what they are, which you find in most private sector organizations. They don't know what their values are. And then you say, OK, doc, neurosurgeon or cardiovascular surgeon, what are your personal values? And they look at me when I'm teaching this five-hour seminar on values like the dog looking at a ceiling fan. Personal <laughs> values. What are, you, what are you talking about, personal values? If you don't have a really sound foundation on your personal and professional values, you can't make good decisions. You're just a windsock. So if, if, if you haven't determined what your personal values are, that might be a good exercise for you to do. Your culture. And then notice the last one in there, humility and service. That's a professional requirement. And by the way, if you haven't noticed, there's a lot of senior strategic leaders making fools of themselves in sex scandals, in drinking scandals, in morality plays, because I have a theory about this. They, they think too highly of themselves. They think they're separate from the rest of the organization, and they don't have to play by the rules anymore. One of the things we haven't talked about over the last two days is humility in service and how every time you think you're going a little bit too far, you better back up because you remember who you serve and what's on the side opposite your name tag. Your presence, 
yeah, all those things are good for a sergeant or a lieutenant or a lieutenant colonel. Your intellect, all five of those are talked about in our doctrinal manual. And then you get into the competencies. Talks about building trust. It gives 12 ways to extend influence. It isn't just directive style and ordering people to do things. There's collective connections and passivity and you know, participatory and all that other stuff. And by the way, I made a huge mistake a couple of months ago, a couple of years ago, actually. I was given a presentation on leadership to a local college in, in Florida where I live now. And it was at an MBA. And the guy said, hey, you, you ought to go to our doctoral program. So I made a huge mistake as a 63-year-old in enrolling in a doctrinal course. I'm two-thirds of the way done. I hate statistics. I just want to openly say that. And what I've learned is this is transformational leadership theory applied in a professional organization with 250-plus years of operational research behind it on the battlefield. So this is some pretty good stuff. I show this to the professors in an MBA course, and they say, wow, where'd you get that? Can I get a copy of that slide? They take pictures of it, like our friends from Sweden. <laughs> said, no, you can just take a look at this book, ADRP 6-22. It's pretty doggone good. Transformational leadership theory applied in a professional organization with 250 years of research and experience behind it. But it still doesn't scratch your itch, right? OK, so let's go into the third phase. When you graduate from the War College, you're looking for more. The level of leadership at the strategic approach requires so much more than that. You've hit many of the things today. What you must do, the different ways of doing this, who you interact with. But again, I'd say most importantly, it has to really deal with what you're doing it for. Before you got here, you were doing it for you and for your organization. After you're leaving here, you're doing it for something much bigger. The problems are much tougher. The challenges are much harder. The other thing that this was shared with me from a mentor, not at the War College. You are passing, and I'm going to bless you all today and say you've now passed, from a meritocracy to an advocacy. Your future promotions will depend on what kind of a teammate you are. It isn't the merit or the things you've accomplished. It's how you're part of the organization. It happens around the time of lieutenant, colonel, or colonel, and yet we don't tell most people that. So how you will be judged is how you're a part of a team, not what your organization's done. Although, certainly, that will be a part of it, how good your organization performs. But it also has to do with how you understand your boss's intent. There's a great book called Leading Up by a guy named Michael Usain that talks about how to get your boss to do what you want them to do. And really what it's all about is understanding their motivations. That applies back, forward, up, down, across the board from a strategic setting. It's understanding other people's motivation. Um, I told you I would give you another definition of leadership. Let's try this. And by the way, this, this is mine, so pick at it. Don't pick at the doctrinal one. This one is one I kind of put together with the help of some other people. At the strategic level, you have to understand the motivations of the people you're dealing with, and even sometimes the people you're not dealing with. Understanding their motivations. You have to gain their trust. You know, whether it's in Georgia, Ukraine, Iraq. I used to wear, as a silly little thing, as a division commander in Iraq, I used to wear my American flag on one sleeve and the Iraqi flag on the other. My boss at the time told me to take the Iraqi flag off. I wouldn't do it. Whenever I went on a battlefield circulation, I always had the Iraqi flag and the Iraqi name tag on. It's a silly thing, but it told people that we weren't there for hearts and minds. We were trying to gain their trust and confidence, and we were part of their team just like they were part of ours. 
influencing people, and there are different ways of doing it. Again, this gets back to the making friends with the civilians in the audience. You have to determine what people want from you. One of the things I learned is the J7 on the Joint Staff, because I had just come out of the Striker Brigade. This one person on the NSC who I was working with on the war plan said, hey, look, I'll trade you. I'll teach you about the interagency process, and you Army guys suck at that. If you'll teach me about what's going on in Army transformation, because I need to know that. So we got together over a couple of beers, shared information, we became close friends. But her comment about you Army guys suck at understanding the interagency process stuck with me. Because we try to throw our culture on other people with a boatload of slides and massive amounts of acronyms and Army talk and impressiveness to show them what, how much testosterone we have when really what we should be trying to do is understand their motivations and why they're trying to accept us. Most Congress people will tell you that, that they have different techniques of listening to the different services. They love listening to the Air Force. They hate listening to the Army. And the Navy seem to be ambivalent. Why, I don't know. You have to talk to the Congress about that. OK? So that's my definition. Communicating purpose takes on a whole new requirement, not only at the strategic level, but because of all the things that you're having to deal with. This is my attempt to fill in the blank with new things at the strategic level. This is just me. These are the things that influence me. What may influence you in the year 2030 or 2033, you're 15 years out, is the requirement for purity, increased civility in this hyper-partisanship role, differences in understanding new technologies, culturally informed, extensive diversity. You know, Matt Cavanaugh said yesterday, gave the example about who would be the four stars in 2030, and he gave you know, the women and the, the, the various culture names. Radical Inclusion, a book by my good friend General Dempsey, if you haven't read it, just came out last week. I'll, I'll hawk it for him right now. Talks about how do you get people in 21st century leadership to be inclusive of others. And we don't do a very good job of that. That's going to be a requirement of military leaders and the armed forces in the 21st century. Notice civility comes up a couple of times. I put youthfulness in there as part of the, the bearing piece because you have to appear energetic at all times. And a great mentor once told me that a leader never has the right to have a bad day. You don't because if you have a bad day, your entire organization is going to have a bad day or they're going to be saying, what's wrong with the boss? And if you look scowly, and nasty and ready to bite somebody's head off, people will stay away from you. And then it doesn't transfer to communication and trust. Take a look at the Army's website and the pictures of senior leaders. Those are some of the ugliest people I've ever seen. And I'm not saying ugly from personal experience. They all got the Sergeant Major scowl on. You ever had a sergeant major who said he wouldn't smile for an official picture because it's not professional? We've taken that on. You know, you had the discussion about balance yesterday. What I'd suggest, balance is partly being happy with what you do if you're fired up about it. That's got to be part of a leader's persona, especially in the new environment where you're facing some things that you've never faced before. Notice over in the intellect, I put number one, Distinguish facts from the narrative. There are competing narratives out there, and people don't want a narrative from military people. They want the Aristotelian facts, logic, reason, passion. Those are the three legs of what Aristotle said you need in every single argument. Logic, reason, passion. Logos. Pathos, ethos. That's what we should be training for, because there's a boatload of people out there just trying to pass a narrative that, in many cases, is just BS. 
you are depended as a strategic leader to get beyond that. It, the competencies are, because it's tougher to do those things, tougher to generate trust, harder to extend your influence, harder to lead up, out, and multiculturally, different communication skills. I don't know what they are. I can't tell you. I wish I could give you the quad error demonstratum. This is what is to be demonstrated. You will face it in the next 15 years. But just know that it's out there. Like I did coming out of the War College, it's going to smack you right upside the head. And you're going to have to say to yourself, I've got to communicate differently. You're going to be asked to go against bigger footprints. I thought my footprint was big in both Iraq and Europe. Yours is going to be bigger because it's going to be in different spaces. It's going to be in the cyber realm and other places. So your footprint requires you to know a lot more things than mine ever did. I put developing key subordinates earlier. That's, you know, I, I, tell, I told a story yesterday to Seminar 11 about General Shinseki was my chief when I became a one-star. And we have this thing, as many of you know, we have the Army Senior Leadership Forum where new one-stars go to it. It's actually called Charm School. We call it the Charm School. And General Shinseki came in, and he, he congratulated all 30 of us for being promoted to general. He said, you guys and gals are really doing great. Thank you for all your service to the country. Thanks for what your, your spouses and families have done moving all over the world. Thanks for your dedication to uh, our Army. Now, let me tell you something. He said, I could put all of you in an airplane tomorrow, fly you out over the Atlantic Ocean, and crash it, and you would all die. And tomorrow, like that, I'd have 30 replacements for you. I mean, that's a heck of a thing to be told after you just were congratulated for being a breeder general. But his point was, we build our bench. And then he told us, I don't care what your job is, if you're the CG of 7th ATC, which I was at the time, or you're an assistant division commander, or you're chief of logistics, or you're, he says, your job one, as I'm concerned, is to develop your subordinates. I'm holding you accountable for that. Take time to develop in coaching, teaching, counseling, mentoring, and performance what you do with your subordinates. That's job one. I learned that lesson and kind of took it with me. But you're going to have to do it earlier because you're going to depend on more people than I depended on. I depended as a one star on the colonels and the lieutenant colonels. You're going to have to go deeper like the Matt Cavanaugh's that were here the other day, the smart guys. Suck them into your orbit and train them. And then finally, the passion and energy under duress and constant contrariness. General Dunlap mentioned that that uh, he thanked me for my service in CNN. When I became a, a CNN analyst, they, and there's a long story behind that, uh, I didn't want to do it, but General Dempsey talked me into doing it. Uh, they asked me to get a Twitter account. So a couple of years ago, I got a Twitter account. It's vile. I mean, it really, and Steve knows, because he's one of my followers, it's vile on there. I get 10, 12 death threats per day just for appearing on CNN and talking about military analysis, if it's not supportive of one person's claim or another. You're going to face that from anonymous people who are inside and outside your organization. If you're doing the right thing, if you're steeped in values, if you know what you're doing, if you're centered as a strategic leader, just block them and delete them. It's fine. It'll be, it'll be just fine. All right. Last thing I'm going to talk about, and then I'll close and we'll ask some questions. We've talked a lot about old dead Carl, Carl von Clausewitz. And he talks a lot about that changing nature and evolving character of warfare. What he doesn't talk about is something I heard the author Tom Wolfe describe to a group of cadets in 1987 at West Point when I was a captain there. I was in my last year of teaching in the PE department. Wolf warned that the military was entering in 1987 because of uh, the all-volunteer force and some changes in the American society and the fact that most people would not serve in uniform. Wolf warned us back then 
that the military was entering into and would have to confront something which he called the fourth phase of freedom's effects. He said, everyone else in America, but not the military, would avail themselves of untold freedoms, incivility, material riches, untruths, coarse behavior, and a lack of civic and civil responsibilities, morals, and ethics. That was 30 years ago. He told cadets in 1987 that during their time in the profession of arms, that the military would find itself required to be the sentinels at the Bacchanal. That's the title of my presentation, by the way. That their generation would find themselves standing guard, his words, at the Lucullian feast of distrust and political intrigue as the Huns approached from the east. And that the military might eventually become armed monks at an orgy. He predicted that's where the military would find itself, and then suggested that we would either fail as a military, or that we would become the model for others to bring themselves back to the center. I don't personally believe in that dark message. I believe more in the democratic institutions which form our countries and the countries of our friends. I have a deeper faith in my fellow man and woman. But I'm personally today a little bit concerned about this. And because we are the only organization that formally trains in a progressive and manneristic way strategic leaders, a lot more falls on you to be the example of that strategic leadership. You have to provide the will in helping to preserve our institutions, advancing our nations, and protecting and defending our Constitution. That's going to challenge you, more so than it ever challenged me. My, my problems were minor. The, the litany of things I talked about earlier, minor stuff compared to what you're going to face. So all I can say is good luck. Be prepared for it. God bless all of you. And thanks for having me come up here. Appreciate it. So I think we have time for maybe a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Hello, General. My Hi. name is Paul Meckelson. I'm a Department of Defense civilian, and I don't nuzzle. I'm a cuddle? To, I'm sorry, sir? Do you cuddle or spoon? <laughs> See me afterwards. OK. Get with me. All right, we'll talk. All right. Uh, looking at your slides and listening to your talk, especially uh, you're, you're mentioning CNN, uh, I've watched over the last uh, 30 or so years uh, a politicization of the, uh, the, the, the core of retired flag officers of our, of our nation's military, becoming more and more politically involved, endorsing candidates, 2016 even acting as a surrogate on the campaign trail. And, and I'd just like to ask your opinion, sir, what, in your opinion, will this do to the profession of, of the military? Uh, what what effect would it have on the civil-military relationship and, of course, that trust that the American public holds in a uh, quote-unquote nonpartisan military over the next uh, 12 to 15 years? Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. You're getting into the whole civil-military relationship piece, and I'm completely in agreement with you. Uh, here's, if I can quickly tell the story of what happened, why I became a military analyst, is because I had a guy from CNN with me in Iraq, a guy named Michael Holmes, and when I retired, he called me up. And he said, you know, CNN asked me to ask you if you'd want to be a military analyst. And I said, oh, hell no. I said, I didn't like you guys when I was in active duty. I don't like you now either. And he said, OK, he laughed. And he said, well, if you ever change your mind, call me back. Well, I went up. I was going up to DC that weekend, uh, had dinner with General Dempsey and his wife because our son was graduating from Johns Hopkins. And uh, I said, hey, Marty, you'll never guess. I got called by CNN. And they want me to And he said, you're going to do it, right? I said, no. And he says, Mark, you got to do it. He says, I am so tired of hearing the SEAL Team 6 member or the strategic <laughs> corporal 
you know, pick apart our strategic plans and talk about what the military does. He says, we need somebody to at least explain. So my wife gave me a dirty look. She didn't want me to do it at all. But I did it because my old friend and boss, my old boss, told me to do it. I've attempted to stay apolitical personally. I think that's what you have to do. I've been asked some questions that when I answered them, they seemed to be apolitical because I was speaking what I thought was the truth in terms of war plans or what you could or could not do in bombing countries and stuff like that. So those could be taken as, apoli as political in nature. What I think you're talking about is the individual who radically does something with a political intent. I have no place for those people. And I agree completely with what General Dunlap said. We agree wholeheartedly. That. We don't agree on everything, but we agree on that. And I think it does denigrate the trust that America has, America has in its people in uniform. It's a long answer, I'm sorry. Uh, one more to close this out. It's lunch. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, exactly. Well, okay. <laughs> Well, sir, we did, in fact, end with a bang. It was a fantastic capstone to uh, a, a nice event, and we uh, greatly appreciate you uh, sharing with us. Okay. Thank you all for having me. Appreciate it.